What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the Neighborhood Podcast. I'm one of the hosts of the podcast, Kevin Valentin. And I'm the other host of the podcast. My name is Kyle Davro. Kevin, what's good, my guy? You know, cooling it at the crib. Just a relaxing Wednesday. Um, you know, we got some some basketball on TV, some NHL playoffs on the TV, but we do got quite a bit of topics to discuss, my boy. Oh, absolutely. So, I mean, there's no shortage of topics on this one. Are uh, you ready to dive into these topics, though? Oh, yeah. All right, so... Um, I'll just try to rapid fire through these ones pretty quick. Uh, first things first, we're going to go over the NBA all pro first team selections. Um, the five players selected were Nikola Jokic, Luka Doncic, Giannis Antetokounmpo, Devin Booker, and Jason Tatum. Uh, we'll talk about that list and we'll talk about the snubs that we thought could, that were uh, missed on that first team. And then after that, we're going to transition to the Western conference finals matchup between the Warriors and the Mavs. Uh, the Warriors are up 3-1 in the series after the Mavs won game four in Dallas. So we'll talk about that game that takes place on Thursday. We'll keep it within the NBA. Uh, we'll focus a little bit on the Brooklyn Nets. We're going to both focus on Kyrie Irving and Kevin Durant since there's kind of some competing headlines between the two of them at this current moment in time. Uh, Kyrie Irving, uh, his status for a long-term extension with the Nets is up in the air. So we don't really know if the Nets and Kyrie are going to be able to agree to terms on some sort of deal um, in the foreseeable future. So we'll dive into that a little bit. We'll also talk a little bit about Kevin Durant not speaking to the Brooklyn Nets uh, front office or organization uh, since the Nets got bounced out of the playoffs uh, about a month ago. We'll talk about whether or not that that's a big deal moving forward. And then after that, we're going to kick it over to the NFL for our last two topics. Uh, the first one being Colin Kaepernick. Uh, worked out for the Las Vegas Raiders. And we'll talk about whether or not that we think that he should get signed to the Raiders as a backup behind Derek Carr. And then after that, uh, we'll talk about the possibility on whether or not that the Pro Bowl is on the way out since there's some discussion about that taking place uh, this offseason. So that's the agenda that we have for you guys. Let's not waste any more time. Uh, let's dive into our first segment, which is going to be this NBA All-Pro first team. Now, like I said at the top, if you guys hadn't heard, the NBA released their All-Pro first team selections uh, from this past season. Uh, the five players selected were Nikola Jokic, Luka Doncic, Giannis Antetokounmpo, Devin Booker, and Jason Tatum. And really the one snub that has really been focused on the last day or so was Joel Embiid. Joel Embiid was essentially a top MVP candidate right outside Nikola Jokic. Now, Jokic did win back-to-back -back MVPs, but Joel Embiid was in second place in the MVP discussion with Giannis in third place. And I think, Kevin, I think I think I could speak for both of us here that that's probably like the biggest snub uh, that we saw from the NBA All-Pro first team. Now, to kick this one to you, just what do you make of this NBA All-First team selection process that took place just the last couple of days or so? I mean, for the most part, I agree with about 80% of it. It's the one person that I disagree with. Um, I understand that this individual was an MVP candidate. I understand that this individual performed at a very high level. I understand that this person was on the NBA's best team. But I didn't think that he deserved to be in the position that he's in if we're talking about just from an overall position standpoint. If that's the wave that the NBA wants to hold to, if that's the rule or voting process of you know the best point guard in the league the best shooting guard and so on and so forth but we're looking at it from a perspective of this should be the top five players in the league in my opinion this should be the top five players uh at their at their at their peak the top five players that you know kind of round out the season as the most consistent as the most dominant players in the nba joel Embiid was second in mvp voting for a reason Joel Embiid won the scoring title for a reason. Joel Embiid played through multiple injuries throughout the entireness of this season, while at the same time going through the adjustments of playing with James Harden and all the loopholes and kind of like chaos that Philly had to go through this season and still was snubbed from an all-first team. Devin Booker, if we're going by position, once again, the order was Booker at point, Luka at the two, Jason Tatum at the three, Giannis Antetokounmpo at the four, and then Nikola Jokic at the center. Nikola Jokic won the MVP. Nikola Jokic was the best center in the game. Nikola Jokic rightfully deserves to be at the five. At the four, 
Giannis Antetokounmpo was the best forward in basketball. You can make the argument for Jason Tatum with Braun and a, and a couple of other players, but between injuries and all these other things, uh, him and KD back and forth missed a significant amount of time. Jason Tatum took that step to lead Boston to the second best seed in the entire NBA, or should I say in the entire Eastern Conference. He's got to go and get that. Luka Doncic playing with second you know, second round draft picks, undrafted people. Uh, Luka Doncic averaging damn near triple-double. I think third, uh, fourth or fifth in MVP voting, so rightfully so. This is his third all-pro or, you know, like kind of like all-first team selection in four years. Devin Booker's the only one where you're like, why is Joel not under this list? Like, you can easily move Luka to the one, Jason to the two, or, you know, I mean, like you can move, like I said, excuse me, Luka to the one, Jason to the two, Giannis to the three, Joel to the four, or, you know, Jokic to the four, and either one of them rotate through five. Those are the five best players in the league. I don't, I, I don't understand why Devin's there. If you're going to make this about position, put people at, their, at, the, at the genuine position that they belong. Luka technically plays the one, so he should be the, 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 the all pro for the one. For the two... I, I, Devin Booker is he really the best shooting guard? I don't I don't necessarily know. Look, Devin Booker sure as shit isn't a point guard, and that's the matchup that they have him at. If that's the case, you go out there and you put Steph Curry, who is the best point guard in the league. I th- th- this whole thing is just inconsistent. This whole thing is weird. I I don't necessarily agree with how the selection process has been over the course of the last thirty years. However long all pros have been existing, I just I don't like the fact that it just has no structure to it. It, it differentiates every single year. And if these are supposed to be the top best players in the league, the top best, the top 15 players in the league, there's some people easily that you would swap on this list. So, I mean, in terms of the all first team, four out of five are okay. Devin's the only questionable one. And again, that's no slander to Devin Booker. Phenomenal player. One of the best young and up and coming players in this league. Joel Embiid definitely deserved to be there over him. I mean, Kevin, I'm in agreement with you on this one. I mean, when I look at Nikola Jokic, I mean, he won back-to-back MVPs. I mean, the guy deserves to be on NBA first team. I look at Luka, same thing. He's been absolutely crushing it the last couple of years with Dallas. Got the Mavs all the way to the Western Conference Finals when nobody was expecting it. Giannis has just been a model of consistency with the Bucks. I mean, coming off of a championship caliber season last year, he just continues to dominate. Uh, for Milwaukee and really like just the center position. Well, you could say four slash five because he does kind of tend to play both sometimes uh, in Milwaukee's rotations, but he's a model of consistency. Uh, Jason Tatum, when I look at Jason, I think he got that simply just because Boston propelled all the way to the second seed. And really the second half of the season is when I thought that Boston really took off. And I think that's in large part due to what uh, Jason Tatum was able to do on a night in night out basis. The one player that I have an issue with is Devin Booker. Now I do believe that Devin Booker deserves to be on an NBA all pro team, just not the first team that should be Joel Embiid. And to me, it's not even close because Joel Embiid was literally neck and neck with Nikola Jokic for the MVP, the entire season. And like Kevin had mentioned, with all the injuries and all the turmoil that Philly had dealt with uh, this season in particular, Joel Embiid was consistent. The guy had the NBA scoring title, like Kevin mentioned. Uh, They were a top four seed in the East this year. And despite all the shifting uh, players that were moved, like when Ben Simmons got traded to Brooklyn, uh, James Harden came into the fold for Philly. Despite that transition, of players going from one place to another, Joel was consistent. And I just find it absolutely like bizarre that Giannis was like an a unanimous pick, but like Joel was never even considered for an NBA all pro first team selection. Because when I look at Joel and beat Kev, I, I think I have to start making this point with Joel. I think he is becoming one of the most, underappreciated uh, bigs that we have in the game. And I actually, I could probably take it one step further, not, not just a big in the uh, NBA, but really like when it comes to players across the entire league, I mean, I have to start putting them up there because when you finish second in the NBA uh, MVP voting and you end up on the NBA all pro second team, 
I mean, don't get me wrong. Like, you know, ending up on all, some sort of all pro team is a major accomplishment, no matter what it is. But to me, the statistics of what Joel did throughout the regular season, that should immediately be in consideration for an NBA all pro first team. And the fact that he didn't get MVP and then he didn't get the all pro first team selection. I think that is a major insult to him because he largely carried Philly on his back the entire season. I mean, Philly has a pretty solid roster when you consider all the players that they have in their rotation, but you take Joel out of that lineup. They may be an outside shot to make a playoffs in the Eastern conference, but outside of that, they're going to be largely an irrelevant team. Joel makes that team viable. And in some cases he makes them more than just viable. He gives them the best chance to win night in and night out. And I mean, the guy averages over 30 points a game this year, basically is just an absolute dominant force down low. And I think for the NBA to not give him his just like, really just to give him his respect from this past season uh, with an NBA all pro first team selection, I think is a major insult to him. Um, and I think that it's uh it's really a disservice just because, you know, if somebody's going to go out there and average over 30 points a game is one of the most dominating centers in the league and just does it consistently for the entire season, you, you got to put him in the NBA all first team. And the fact that they didn't, I think it was a major disservice to him. And I think it, it really does show, I think, a level of disrespect that Joel Embiid receives. Um, the guy's a phenomenal player. And it, it, it does. it's a little um, concerning to me that um, he was never considered for an NBA All-Pro first team. But, you know, that committee has some sort of way of being able to select the players that they want. Granted, I know they, they base it off a of position, which I do understand. But... I think it was a uh, I think it was a disservice to leave Joel off that list for NBA All Pro First Team. That's just how I see it. Yeah, no, it's it, it's super weird. And guys, we're not saying he didn't make a team. He made the second team. So that Kia, uh, you know, All Second Team is going to be Steph Curry, Demar Derozan, Kevin Durant, Joel Embiid, and John Morant. And then third team is going to be LeBron James, Chris Paul, Pascal Siakam, Trey Young, and Carl Anthony Towns. Again. Every player on this list rightfully belongs there. Pascal Siakam, you can kind of make a little bit of an argument for, depending on you know who you're talking to. But again, I understand why he led Toronto to a fifth seed. Toronto was deemed to be washed up after you know the Kyle Lowry signing in Miami, and you know Pascal's been injury prone the past couple of seasons. So for him to overcome that average, what he was, um, I believe that he, you can make the argument. But when you look at second team, once again, if we're talking about definitive position. The position that you are classified as, there are two point guards on this team. It's inconsistent. You have technically, what, three forwards on the first team? We're talking about freaking two point guards here. We're talking about look, De DeMar plays the small forward in Chicago, but he's usually classified as a shooting guard. Kevin Durant plays the, the three, but is classified as a four in this situation. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's just... There's too many holes in the voting methods. There's just too many inconsistencies for this voting process. And first and second team are just totally different. I just I don't understand how we're just we're that far apart in making a consistent format. It should be the best point guard, the best shooting guard, the best small forward, power forward and center, or the top five best players in the NBA, and you get rid of positions. I, 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 mean, I personally am just frustrated with how inconsistent this is year in and year out. Well, here's the thing. I think there's somebody that we're also forgetting um, who could have been in the NBL first team, and that's John Morant. I think if John Morant didn't Doesn't go get down hurt, with yeah. that injuries at, at the end of the season where he missed like essentially what was like the last like month of the season or like the last like five to six weeks of the season, mm -hmm. I think he would have ended up in the NBA All-Pro first team. Because, he would I mean, have taken was, Dev in spot 100%. Yeah, and I think the only reason why they gave it to Dev was just because I don't think Job ja, ja missed the last, like, I don't know. Last, Six like, weeks or something. The last 10 to 15% of the games of the year. So, you know, that's significant. So, you know, it's unfortunate. But, you know, when I look at Joel Embiid, I think that's really kind of the, the person that really kind of sticks out to me as far as, like, who was, like, the biggest snub. It was probably him. And if I had to pick yeah. somebody who was second, it'd probably be jaw but i could understand why they they didn't put jaw 
as the uh, NBA All Pro first team just because he did miss uh, a pretty significant amount of time at the end of the year. So that part Agreed. I do understand. But right, you know. But like Kevin said, eighty percent of this list is fine. You know, honestly, and it really kind of signifies what Kevin and I have been talking about the last couple months or so, really the last couple of years or so. And and that is the the international wave that has just taken over the top of the NBA players. Like, you know, you look at Luka, you look at uh, Nikola Jokic, you look at Giannis, and, and even Joel Embiid, all of these are international players. And they have just taken the league by storm and are, are, are changing the game in a way that I don't think that we've seen in quite some time just as far as like the international presence. I mean, granted, we've seen great international players in the past. Uh, we've seen the man Ginobili. We've seen Dirk Nowitzki. We've seen, I think, Hakeem Olajuwon. I mean, there's been a multitude of players that have come from international uh, places and have dominated in the NBA, you know, that end up with Hall of Fame careers. But I think really, like, when you look at the top of the NBA right now, you have to kind of think that's like most of these players are international. And that, that really just kind of goes to show, you know, a lot of these European players, they're ready to go into the NBA because they, it's like what I think Lucas said, like getting, getting like 30 points in like a Euro league game is a lot more difficult than what it is in an NBA game, just with the game and how it's officiated and how it's actually played. So it wouldn't surprise me if this just continues, like if the international wave, that international trend just continues on the way that it is because those guys are prepared to coming into the NBA and they're definitely proving it. So I know, I know your boy, Luca, that's his third one, right? For NBA third in four years. Yeah. First team. Hey, it's good yes, on him, sir. bro. So under 25 too, bro. 23 so, years old. It's nuts. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that, that'll be somebody that we talk about in our next segment. So we're to go to the Western Con- West, excuse me, the Western conference <laughs> finals matchup. I mean, I had to really kind of, Put that it's one okay. together. It's okay. Um, just to kind of give you guys an update on where this series stands right now, uh, the Golden State Warriors are up three one in the series over the Mavs. Um, in Game Four, the the Mavericks did defeat Golden State by the score of one nineteen to one hundred nine. Definitely keeps the Mavs alive for another game. Uh, this Game Five does take place in San Francisco. It will take place in the Chase Center. So this is a opportunity for the Warriors to close it out, but this is also an opportunity uh, for the Mavs to extend the series to possibly get this series back to Dallas for Game Six, and that's where we're going to take this segment next. So, Kevin, to kick this one to you, in Game Five between the Mavs and the Warriors, do you see the Warriors closing the series out, or do you see the Mavs pushing the series to a Game Six? Well, before I go out there and I make my prediction, let me just first say. Game four in and of itself was exactly the type of basketball, aside from the fourth quarter, and I'll get into that in a second. Kyle's probably laughing in the background, but dude, this is the basketball that this team has played this postseason. This is the basketball that shows that we can compete with anyone. At one point, guys, if you did not see the game, it was a 29-point game before the fourth quarter started. It was complete and utter dominance. We dominated them in the paint. We had outshot them outside the three-point line. Um, everybody was kind of getting involved. It wasn't really like one focalized person. I know that Luca ended up with 30 at the end of the fourth because he had to come back in the game. But we're, we're, we're talking about overall production from players that have not shown up in quite some time. Reggie Bullock goes 0 for 10 in game three. He ends up with 15. Dorian Finney-Smith, who hasn't been seen basically since Phoenix game four, he shows up with 23. Um, you know, excuse me, Reggie Bullock had 18. Uh Jalen Brunson had a kind of an off night, shot under 50%. He still gave us 15. Then you have Maxi Kleba, a guy that has not been able to shoot basically since the beginning of the second round of uh, against Phoenix. He pulls up with 13 points, three blocks, and eight rebounds off the bench. And then you look at Spencer, had an off night, still was able to give us double digits, but he contributed eight assists. This team can come back if it was a team to go out there and say, you know what? We're going to go and break history. Not because we have a lot of names, not because we have a, a, a fat stacked roster with talented players. If we play consistently, attack the basket, kick out to the open shooter, get into a rhythm, but make sure we're still getting to the free throw line and playing solidified defense as a team, we can. Now, to get into my, to get into my prediction, I think Golden State closes it at home in game five. 
the my main reason for this is because the fourth quarter. I understand for those that did watch the game, that was our second unit. I understand that for those that watched the game, that was also their second unit. That's my problem. Jordan Poole, Moody, Kaminga, Looney, whoever else came in the game, because at the end of the day, all I know is that I saw a bunch of freaking blue jerseys just absolutely annihilating us in the fourth quarter to where it was a 39-point quarter for them, and we ended it with 20. And the only reason that happened was because we started trickling our starters back in slowly. For three quarters, we were the better team. For three quarters, we looked like we could push this to a game six if possible and come back home and fight for, you know, the potential to play a game seven. Then that fourth quarter comes, man, and even when our starters were in, we could not stop the second unit. Jordan Poole files out with about four minutes to go. Steph Curry's reinserted into the lineup. So is Wiggins, and so is Clay Thompson with about three minutes to go. And Golden State continues to chip away. I'm looking at this, and I'm saying, damn, we had an opportunity to blow the doors off, rest our starters for the equivalent of a quarter, and you know we, we gained momentum going into game five. Instead, we end the game dodging a bullet when we were up 29, almost 30 points, and we won by 10. It was 109 to 19, the final score. That doesn't sit well with me. That doesn't sit well that in the fourth quarter, we decided to continue to chuck up threes. Granted, we shot incredible for the game. Our three-point percentage at one point, or for, to end the game, ended at 46.5, but we ended up missing six or seven threes, if not eight, in the fourth quarter alone. So we were shooting over 50% for the majority of this game, three-point percentage-wise. I'm nervous that once again, we're going to deviate from the game plan, which was to attack the paint, get to the free throw line, and kick to the person that was open. If we can hit those shots, if we can follow that game plan, I can see us pushing this at least to a game six. The way the game ended, the way that we struggled in that fourth quarter, even with our starters, and Golden State didn't even put everybody back. They didn't put Looney back in. They didn't put Draymond back in. So it, it really was the, the, a mixture of the bench and the starting three. I don't know if we can do it. I don't think we will. I think Golden State being home, them being not embarrassed because they, they closed the margin, but you know, if Golden State can, can shoot better from the field early on, I think that they'll be fine. Uh, Steph didn't have the greatest game. Clay didn't have the greatest game outside of the third quarter. Um, obviously, you know, Jordan Poole was kind of lackluster on defense and fouled out in four quarters. So it's a, it's a lot. I know I've just rambled for like about eight minutes by myself, but I truly believe, you know, if the Mavericks play consistent, we can win. But my prediction is like, we've been all postseason very inconsistent. Um, I would probably say Golden State finishes this in five, but thank God we didn't get swept. Me, Kevin, I'm in agreement with you on this one. I think Golden State's going to close this one out in game five. I just have no faith with what Dallas can do on the road. And when I look back to game two, you guys had a double-digit lead at halftime, and then you guys just utterly fell apart in the second half of that game too. And that's really been the Mavs' struggles this entire postseason. It's been playing on the road. You know, granted, you could look back to the game seven in Phoenix where you could look at the one specific instance where they actually played well, but you will go to the flip side. Phoenix probably played the worst game of the year in that specific instance. Golden State, look, they are championship pedigree. They've been here before. They have the personnel to do it. And I don't think they're going to allow an utter collapse like Phoenix allowed in the second round of the playoffs when they went up against the Mavs. I just don't see it. I mean, when I look at Golden State, I think Golden State may actually start game five in a little bit of trouble because I do think the Mavs are actually going to get out to a pretty decent start. And that's really been the one thing that the Mavs have done consistently in pretty much all of their playoff series this year, whether it was against Utah, Phoenix, and now Golden State. They've gotten off to relatively good starts. It's just they suck in the second half. They just don't make the proper adjustments in the second half and maybe that's Jason Kidd maybe that's just individual players on the Mavs just not knocking down their shots and just allowing the other team to just go absolutely bonkers with knocking down shots but you know unless the Mavs can show me that they can play all four quarters effectively against Golden State I think Golden State should be able to take this one pretty comfortably at home in game five I think you know when I look at Steph I think Steph's gonna probably drop somewhere around 25 maybe 30 points. I think Clay is going to drop somewhere in between 15 to 18. I could probably say the same thing for Jordan Poole. It really kind of depends on how many minutes Jordan plays. I think if he plays like 20 to 25, he'll he'll get around 
10 to 15. If he plays closer to 30 to 35, he could probably put up 20. And, you know, when I look at the Mavs, the Mavs are really de dependent on three players. Luka, Spencer Dinwiddie, and Jalen Brunson. That's really been the three focal pieces when it comes to their offense. And let's face it, they've been way too inconsistent for me to bet on just because there are games where Spencer can put up 20 to 25 points. And then there are other games where he can put up like 10, you know, Jalen's been pretty consistent behind Luca because Luca's just been essentially averaging closer to like 30 to 35 points a game, you know, but you know, Jalen, if he's not shooting effectively, he may be lucky to drop 20 points. So it really kind of depends on which Dallas team shows up. If, they're knocking down their shots consistently. I think that they could, you know, definitely make this game a little bit closer. But if they show me anything like they did in game two, especially in the second half, Golden State should take this fairly comfortably. It should be like a double digit win for the Warriors in that case. And the way that I see this game playing out is I think Dallas will get off to a hot start. And then the Warriors, they're going to make a ferocious comeback in the third quarter. And it's going to just propel them into the fourth quarter. And I think. They're just going to carry that momentum on in the fourth quarter and take it all the way to the finals. So I got Golden State winning this one. Um, I'm going to say by about 10 points. I think Golden State's going to find a way to win this one by double digits. And um, I see the Warriors moving on to the finals. And when it comes to the Mavs, obviously falling short of the finals, um, it's disappointing. But when I look at what the Mavs have accomplished this year, uh, it's been nothing short of phenomenal. I don't think anybody was expecting them to go this far with the roster that they have currently constructed, but it's really a testament to Luka Doncic, uh, despite whatever sort of criticism Kevin may throw his way, because God only knows that he he does get negative with Luka sometimes. But I have to say, with the the list of players on the roster outside of Jalen, Luka, and Spencer, I mean, this team is marginal at best. I mean, I would say subpar is probably a better description for this team outside of those three players. And the fact that Luka was pretty much the driving force to get them to this point. That's really a credit to him at 23 years old. So yeah, war the Warriors are moving on and uh, the Mavs are going to be on their way to Cancun. That's just how I see it. Hey, use the word Cancun a little lightly. You know what I'm saying? We still have the possibility. And I'm going to make one final comment on the Luka thing. I have my negative critiques with him for my reasons. And you know what the best part about it is? Mavs Twitter that is ungodly biased toward to that man. And the announcers that are Reggie Miller and Stan Van Gundy, whom I despise calling games, have all made it abundantly clear that what I have been saying is justified. When you are hell-bent on complaining on one end of the floor, and it is five on four with the fastest-paced team in the league, and eight out of ten times it leads to three points in a transition three, it starts to become a problem. I understand. And your lack of defense and effort when you get switched on, is annoying. I get it. 23, he is young. But the, again, the best part is they said it on national television. The excuse will only get you so far when it is hindering your team's capability of winning important games. I understand. Here's how I'm going to break it down to you. Because I, I understand the criticisms that you have towards Luca. However, though, this needs to be said. When it comes to your criticism of Luka Dodgers, like when it comes to like the weight between how you criticize Luka and how you admire and respect Luka's game, there are times where you look at Luka and there's more criticism. Like what I'm saying is your overall analysis of him sometimes is to the point where you're putting more weight on the, on the critique of him based on, or I mean, in comparison to what he's actually doing in a positive manner. And I, I won't deny that. I critique him very heavily, and that is because he's on my favorite basketball team. Remember, I am a Dallas Mavericks fan first. I, so I, when you start hindering my, my fucking team's ability to win, and you're like constantly in that conversation but, of, bro, what are you doing? It becomes a burden. It becomes redundant. It's like yelling at a kid to stop touching something they're not supposed to touch. It just, I, it's frustrating. That's I, all. I understand. But at the same time, there are multiple reasons why 
the Mavs are being hindered to the extent that they are. It's not just Luke. agreed. No, 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 I, no, no. I, no. Not I. I will never just solely blame him. The team itself is too inconsistent. Luca's play at times is just. I want to say spotty because there are times when he gets back on defense and he, he actually le- he led the series, uh, I believe the Phoenix series in steals, which is beyond me. So it's not like, you know, he's not doing anything. It's just situationally, if he is unable to physically stay in front of you, he just gives up. He doesn't try to recover. He doesn't try to help. He doesn't try to rotate. And then again, as I've stated a thousand times, it seems like since he's gotten into the league, he is looking for that call that isn't coming, and he's either whining, complaining, still on the ground. He throws a tantrum when he misses a layup, and it leads to transition buckets. If we were to lose by a close margin of effort within a certain amount of games, I would start to blame that consistently on him because it's like he gave up three points here. He got a tech. That's four points. He missed a couple of free throws. You can get very, very critical of superstars, just like LeBron James receives criticism for everything he does. If you want to be in that upper echelon of top tier, that, that, that first team all NBA, you're going to get the extra critique. And when you play the way you do and you average 30, 10, or 39 and 8 for three or four years, what are we going to critique if offensively you're already putting out those numbers? Your defensive I, aspects are hurting this team and your mentality is hindering whatever's left of critique we have left. So, of I, course, I'm going to hone in on the flaws. I can explain that. And I think, I, I think you may understand where I'm coming from with this. I think when it comes to general fans who see somebody of his caliber at the age that he's at, I think we tend to leave a little bit of room to allow those players to be able to grow, to be able to right. learn from their mistakes. And, and yes. the thing is, you know, I can't, I don't think that we could be as harsh with Luca. And you could say the same thing like with, with LeBron when he was like in like his early twenties. A hundred percent. Like that's why I made like, the comparison. Like. You know, when LeBron got into his mid-20s to late-20s, okay, then that's a different situation because, well, he's been in the league for six, seven years. That's a completely different situation when he's only been in the league for four years. Because to me, that's when you really start seeing players who are really good start to take off. It's really once they hit like their third, fourth year in the league, they start making leaps and bounds in their career. And honestly, that's what we've seen from Luka. He's a three-time NBA All-Pro first-team candidate. I mean... The fact that he's done that by the age of 23 is outstanding. I have to give him a tremendous amount of respect to be able to do, to do that at, at such a young age. It, but it will get to a point where the critique will become a little bit more honed in. I think that comes with later age, though. We're not at that point yet. Well, I'm not at that point yet because yeah. I have to allow room for him to make mistakes. And the thing is, there are going to be plenty of times where he's going to learn from his mistakes. The, I'm not saying like he's like 33 years old and he's got a limited amount of time left. I mean, for God's sakes, you know, 30 years old from him is seven years down the road. You know, Which so is nuts, the, but yeah. The, there's going to be a lot of time for Luca to be able to develop not only his game better, but just develop his overall mental attitude that comes along with it. Because, I mean, 23 years old, Kev, I mean, picture us at 23 years old. Did we have it all together at 23 years old? No, like, but I, 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 I'm not going to go f- that far because I also like to remind people that the man also played two to three years pro in Europe. He's said, also the type to say publicly that European basketball is officiated differently. If you're expecting everything, you need to get that out your mind, bro. You ain't get it in Europe. You should be used to it. But because he got a couple of flaky calls in the beginning of his rookie year, because he got a little bit more contact fouls for throwing his head up in transition, he's been babied into this softer NBA. He was groomed in it when he came over from Europe. But he's starting to realize when you become that upper echelon, you get less calls. Mm -hmm. Braun does it. KD does it. CP3 does it. Like they, they, They don't get everything in the world. As much as we like to critique them for complaining and, oh, damn, that looked like a foul... If you didn't get it, you got to get back on defense. Emotions are understandable, but you have to be able to control them. You've been a pro and for I six understand. years. I am including I Europe because everyone likes to say, oh, he won an MVP. He won a championship in Europe. This is one of the most put-together players we've ever seen in NBA history coming from overseas. Cool. I'm holding you to that. I'm carrying that resume over and adding that to your NBA resume that you should be ready that officials are not your fucking friend. 
Get your ass back on defense, come to camp in shape next season, and be ready to defend. The NBA is only getting more athletic. If you're going to be an all-pro, if you're going to be a main focal point for the NBA and the Dallas Mavericks, you need to not be a liability on the defensive end. That's it. That's what I'm trying to say. I, I'm not saying be a, two, a two-way player like Jordan. I'm not saying be like Kobe. But God damn it, give, show me something that isn't a, a loose ball or an arid pass that you're going to come up and steal like a, like a corner on, on, on a flat route. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I need effort from you. I need you to close your mouth and show me effort on the court. And when you're shooting shitty from the field, don't keep shooting. 10 of 26. He had 30 points, but on 26 shots. If that was KD, if that was Giannis, if that was Braun, it would be a whole different conversation of saying, well, no shit, anybody's going to score on that many attempts. Oh, you went to the free throw line 14 times. This is exactly what I myself did and everybody else did with James Harden. More than 50% of his points came from the free throw line. You're not shooting efficient, you're turning the ball over, you're not playing defense, and you're a liability in transition because you yourself feel that your bitchiness is more important than the play at hand. The ball doesn't stop because you complain. The ball doesn't stop because Luka Doncic thinks he got hit. If you're going to bring up my critiques of Luka Doncic, I'm going in. I don't care if it's a separate segment. I'm, I'm, I'm letting people know I'm appreciative of the 30, 10, and 8. I'm grateful we're in the Western Conference Finals because of him. But if you want to hold him to that offensive regard and praise, let's not be blindsided or blinded by his greatness that we're not looking at the fact that he literally stopped playing four separate times in three quarters just because we were up. Even when it was closer in the first half, there were two instances where he felt he got knocked and one of them he actually got clipped in the nuts. So that one I'll give him a pass on. But dude, you can't just stop. He missed a wide open layup in the third quarter to start it. And threw his hands up, put his hands on his knees, five on four the other way, Clay Thompson gets a mid-range jump shot. It's things like that that add on and refs pay attention to. Stop acting like you're five, you're 23, but you've been a pro for longer. I'm letting it be at that. That's, that was essentially my point, is sometimes like the way that you weight the criticism compared to what he does in a positive aspect for, for the Mavs. It, that's where it seems like the the criticism is a little too heavy. I understand I'm, like I'm, I'm the, really the, the the critiques I think are are valid. I think it's the point that I'm making is the the ferocity of the criticism. And you're right. It comes across aggressive. I'm an overpassionate fan. I do the same thing with all my teams, Kyle. We've been best friends for years. You know that when my team sucks, I'm going oh, yeah. in. I don't have a filter. I don't care. We do it to the megastars in all of sports. Tom Brady has a bad day. He's coming off the cliff. Aaron Rodgers loses in the second round. Aaron Rodgers is washed. He's never going to win again. And so on and so on and so forth. When people fail to perform in the spotlight. Well, I understand that I just made comparisons to Hall of Famers, but I'm, I'm using the reference of superstars. Luka will be a Hall of Famer, though. Luka's going to be a Hall of Famer. Right, but we're talking about... I, I made an example with established... 30 plus almost 40 year old quarterbacks that are for sure first ballots. Yeah. If Luca were to fall off a cliff in the next two years, no one's going to give a shit. He's still 23. Well, I, I mean, I mean, I mean, you, you brought up Tom Brady. I mean, like Tom Brady, I mean, he, he did win three Super Bowls in his first four years. I mean, I take that into account, but it's like the world wasn't like falling apart after they had a bad year no. in 2002 after they beat the Rams in the Super Bowl. They just had a no, bad no. year, but look what, you know, and sometimes. Hey, sometimes, bro, you need to get your ass kicked to kind of, you know, reset and, and refocus. And sometimes that's a great motivator. because, And that's why I agreed with what you said last episode when you reminded me Kobe got swept, Shaq got swept, Jordan got swept. It, it builds LeBron, character. Bron Bron's got swept. I, I, I mean, I mean, these are Hall I of it. Famers. I, I, think right. Bron, I think Bron's been swept twice. Two or, th two or three uh, times. Finals. Shaq's, Shaq was swept six times. Six yeah, I times. think in the in in the finals and maybe his first playoff thing. I think I think. Oh no! And he got swept in the final. He got swept in the finals twice. twice. Didn't he lose to Golden State twice or Golden State and then San Antonio? San Antonio was the other one, right? Two thousand seven. Like, you know, but the thing is, like, even like that San Antonio team, they knew what the Braun was going to be. They 100%. they knew what was coming. So, and the thing is, I think a lot of I think a lot of players and a lot of teams around the NBA they they look at Luca and they see. This dude is going to be a problem. And he's a already fact. a problem. So, you know, listen, I enjoy the fact that Lucas got off to a great start in his NBA career. I mean, I've seen him play. 
it's a thing of beauty. Nuts, bro. That, 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 in that's, person, that, nuts. That step back game that he has, he gets just that little bit of separation against the defender and, and just freaking wets a shot from 30 to 35 feet out. Yeah. It, it, it's a thing of beauty. So, you and, know, and like, his court vision. The, the criticism, I understand that, you know, in certain aspects, I think it's valid. The only thing is, is that I don't weight the criticism more than what he actually puts out in the court in a, in no, a productive no, you're way. You're right. So, you know, that's really just kind of how I see it. I think that's what Mike and I were trying to say to you uh, the yeah. other day about Luca because, <laughs> listen, I, I love the fact that you keep it real. You, you know, you're very honest and you're very passionate about your team and Luca specifically. But at the some, at some times, I think it kind of gets lost in translation just based on how, like, aggressive you get with the criticism and I, I, I but i get aggressive with all of them i uh, get mad when spencer sucks i get mad when fucking dwight powell is useless in which i stand by he still is fucking useless <laughs> i get very pissed off when reggie bullock went 10 went over 10 and maxi kleba was fucking god knows what he was i swear to god i've dropped the f-bomb at least a hundred times in this one segment alone but that's how infuriated this team gets me so i will I will drop the Mavericks conversation. We both predicted them to lose this game, so let us move on to the next subject. All right. Well, we're gonna <laughs> ki- that was fun. I, I, it I definitely was. We, we needed to address the criticism part. I needed that, to let that, it out. Yeah, exactly. But listen, Luca's going to be a Hall of Famer. That I can guarantee you. He, he's on that path, bro. He's on that path. Right. But uh, with that said, we're going to talk about a team that is, well, been out of the playoffs for quite some time now, and that is the Brooklyn Nets. Uh, and we're going to focus on uh, Kyrie Irving specifically first. Now, if you guys had seen any sort of Nets basketball this year, you knew that Kyrie Irving was in and out of the lineup uh, based on his stance uh, with the NBA's rules uh, against COVID-19. He wasn't able to play in any of the home games for large stretches of this past season. Uh, for Brooklyn, ba- just based on the the local mandates and ordinances uh, that New York City had in regards to COVID nineteen. Now he was able to play in the playoff games for Brooklyn at home. Uh, I believe the mayor of New York ended up shifting the COVID policy, which allowed uh, unvaccinated uh, players in the NBA to actually play in New York City uh, this past spring. But one of the things that we're going to talk about specifically is Kyrie Irving and his future with the Brooklyn Nets. Now, there's been some reports that have been surfacing that Kyrie Irving and his future with Brooklyn is kind of up in the air because Brooklyn's front office is not necessarily dead set on extending Kyrie Irving for a long-term extension. And a lot of that, I think if I had to kind of guess it or assume it, it's based on the fact that his availability is in question. And not just from this past season, but in prior seasons uh, with you could look at teams like Boston that he was on and it, some of the earlier stints that he had in the first couple of years with Brooklyn as well. So, Kevin, I'm going to pose this question to you. Do you think that the Nets and Kyrie Irving are going to be able to work out some sort of long-term extension in the near future? Well, before you actually change the camera angle, let's switch it back to just the two of us because I'm, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions that I've been thinking about uh, in regards to this particular topic. Okay. This is a business decision. You're an NBA GM. You see a prospect. Let's just leave him nameless. A top 15, 20 prospect. And he's available for you to re-sign. But you're looking at it and you're saying, damn, in the last three years in which he has been on my roster, he has been a distraction. He has not been available for various reasons. COVID aside, injuries, uh, days off or mentality, you know, like him having those those activist speeches. And again, I'm, I'm in full support of some of the things that he did. But again... As, as an employer, your, your, your employee is not there. I don't care about the issues that Kyrie has been going through, his stances, his beliefs. You are being paid to do a job. Are you going to pay Kyrie Irving, Kyle? Would you pay him right now? It, like for, a, for long term, for long term, for about a three, four year deal. Would you give him that, would you give him that security? It, it depends on how like big of a contract that he wants. Am I giving Kyrie Irving's is gonna he's his talent alone is gonna get him in the thirties. We already know that right now he's set to make I think about thirty six million dollars. He's not gonna settle for less. He's not gonna take a pay cut. Let's just assume it stays the same thirty six thirty seven a year for three years. I'd probably try to 
bargain it down a little bit less just because the available the availability issue is a big one of concern for me. Uh, anything that close that approaches forty million dollars a year, I'm out. I'm like at that point, it's not worth we're, it because we're already on the precipice of forty million. We're three million away for the NBA. That's piss money. We're talking about that's wiping I, the ass. I, I'm just saying at that point. I'm taking that. I'm knocking that down ten million dollars, bro. I'm 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 knocking you automatically, bro. Twenty five, twenty five. You want you want long term? I'm not giving you thirty five. I'm not giving you forty. You're not touching that. And if you don't want long term, I'll give you thirty six or one year. I'll give you thirty a year, two year. Bro, Stephen A. Smith has been saying this for weeks, and he has been shat on on all of his takes about Kyrie Irving. I, again, it has nothing to do with his stance. Kyle, he's not showing up for work. He's, in the last three seasons, opted out for COVID, injured, and COVID restrictions, and then this year, COVID with the vaccine. It doesn't matter. You're not showing up for work. You want to be a distraction. You want to be a person that's not being able to be relied upon as a leader. You're one of the best players on this team. I'm not giving you money. And if I am, bro, you got to prove it. Stephen A. Smith said it perfectly. I will give you the maximum I can give you one year at a time with incentives, of course. You got to report like the Carson Wentz deal. You got to play 75% of the snaps. I need you to show up for 75% of the games. I need you to be available. If that is something that you can't do for us, I can't, I can't hire you. I can't employ you. I cannot afford to give you this money that I could be given to somebody else to attract that is going to be here every single day and put in work. Will he give me the same production that Kyrie does? There is very little and far in between the amount of people that can give you the efficiency and consistency that Kyrie does when he wants to play. But that's the phrase, when he wants. Bro, you've had an injury history since college. That has been overlooked. Now you're becoming a distraction, and now your stance and your political, religious, whatever beliefs are getting in the way of you having a responsibility for your job. You are being paid. This isn't volunteer work. If I'm Brooklyn, and I can't get a short-term deal done, even if it's a short-term max deal to where Kyrie has a, it's a two-year with a team option, I'm not doing it. I can't. Any NBA franchise, bro, I don't care how desperate you are. Or should I say any competitive? Because, you know, we all know that there are some shitty teams that would throw a bag at him, and that's because just out of the sheer talent that Kyrie Irving is. If I'm the Nets, bro, you're getting a one or two deal at max. A one or two year deal at max. And that's it. There's not an in-between. Kev, I think for me, I'm basically along the similar sentiment with you. It's just... I think we all can acknowledge, you know, Kyrie's skills as a basketball player are damn near unmatched. I mean, his handles are the best in the league. He's a great mid-range shooter. He's just an overall great basketball player to watch. That's just the skill set part. But it's like you said, when it comes to the availability aspect, I mean, you have to be able to show up, you know, night in and night out on a consistent basis. You have to at least play 75 you know, 80% of the games, if you're healthy, if you're, of course. He- if, you're not, if you're not healthy, look, everybody goes through injuries. It, injuries are just a part of the game. There's nothing you could do about that. But when you look at Kyrie Irving and you look at really the, the reasons on why he's taking these extended leaves of absence from the nets, um, the, the, the last couple of years that he's been with them, it starts to become a distraction and the team's not going to put up with it, especially when it comes to a, a long-term extension where there's possibly a three to four, maybe a five year deal on the table. You know, they're going to definitely factor that in if you're not showing up consistently. I mean, look, you know, when you look at Kyrie's past, for example, I mean, Kevin, I think we could both kind of look back to what he did in the bubble. I mean, Kyrie Irving was one of the advocates in the NBA bubble, basically saying when the whole George Floyd thing was going on, that they would basically like boycott at the NBA bubble for the entire playoff run. Now I understand like a lot of the players, like they, they had their opinion on what happened with George Floyd, but they were all of the mindset that we should continue to to play basketball despite whatever's going on around the world. And, you know, Kyrie was one where he's like, no, we got to like put that to the side. We got to put basketball to the side. We got to focus on this, you know, this uh, social uh, cause like right here, right now. And we got to put basketball in the rear view to get that out of the way. I mean, that's just one example. You look at what he's done the last couple of years, you know, he's really kind of taken this 
what I would say is, uh, you know, a pretty big spiritual turn uh, the last couple of years. I mean, for God's sakes, I think, you know, when he's playing with the Celtics, I mean, he was burning sage in pregame warmups on the sidelines. Now, if that's to get him in his right mind or, you know, to like get into like his Zen or whatever, fine, whatever. I, I think it's a little weird, but you know what? To each his own, if that's what he's got to do, so be it. But, you know, once it starts getting into, you're missing a, a large portion of the games year in and year out, no matter what the reason is. I think not this past season, but the year before, he was having like political discussions with local legislators and, and taking times of absence away from the nets to focus on that stuff. I understand, like, you know, I, I could respect, you know, Kyrie trying to be able to, you know, I guess like expand um, his knowledge on certain things and, and try to, you know, be a more vocal part of the community. But if it's coming at the expense of your job, you know, the nets are going to look at you a little bit sideways for that. And then, you know, when it comes to the whole COVID situation this year, you know, that's where I think it's really starting to become a hindrance for the team and the organization as a whole. Because, you know, when Kyrie signed on with the Nets, they were of the mindset, you know, that he was going to play 70, 80, 85, possibly 90% of the games, you know, barring some sort of injury and possibly lead Brooklyn to a championship along the way, or at least keep them in contention for a title. You know, especially when they brought KD in, it changes the entire dynamic of the team when you got KD and Kyrie running the show. I mean, you're going to love seeing those guys perform at a high level every single night, but if Kyrie's not on the court consistently and the idea of a long-term contract extension comes up, you're going to look at his antics and what he's done the last couple of years, and it's like, I can't trust you because you have just a bunch of these reasons that keep popping up and where basketball is no longer the priority because you're just focused on all these other things that you think are important. And I understand uh, from Kyrie's perspective that, you know, he could have those things that are, imp are important to his life, but you know, your job is something that you have to constantly go to day in and day out. And I mean, look, when you're making 30, $35 million a year, that's where your priorities should be. But obviously to him, it's not. And I think that there's going to be some consequences from that because Brooklyn is of the mindset that, they can't bank on him for a long-term extension, maybe a one or two year deal at best for like 30 to 35 mil. But I mean, if there's any sort of discussions about Kyrie trying to get like a 40 to $45 million contract for like the next four to five years, I think Brooklyn would be out of their minds to give him something like that because they can't trust him. And honestly, if I was a GM, if I was in the front office for the Nets, I wouldn't either. But if, if Kyrie was there all the time where there was no distractions whatsoever, I'd definitely be more open to giving him a larger long-term extension contract, but that's not the case. So I can definitely understand uh, the Nets position here. And as far as their hesitancy to give him a long-term extension, and it's really because of Kyrie himself. He's a great basketball player. Nobody denies that, but two things can be true at the same time. He's a great basketball player, but he hurts himself in the process because he's just focused on too many things at one time. And, I think it's going to cost him. To what extent? I guess we'll find out. Time will tell. And that's the you know that's the perfect segue into the next part because Kevin Durant, his counterpart, the, the the guy that chose to come with Kyrie to Brooklyn, is now also a headlining news for sports. And apparently, Kevin Durant has not been in contact or communication with the Nets front office since they were swept out of the playoffs. Now I know to a lot of people that may not mean anything. But with Kyrie being in the headlines, Brooklyn obviously ending the way that they did, and now the best player on the team uh, is not talking to anybody, completely distancing himself. Kyle, I'll pose this one to you. Do you think that there's anything of this KD news, or is this just smoke blowing because Brooklyn's on fire right now? Kev, do you talk to your work when you're off from work? No. On your days off? Yeah, that's no. that, that that's kind of how I feel about this one. Uh, to be quite honest with you, I don't think that this is a big deal. I think KD is just kind of getting away, um, doing his own thing now that the NBA offseason is kind of like off and running for him. And I think, you know, Brooklyn's just kind of giving him space, and I think KD is kind of doing the same thing. So, I mean, look, when we look at Kevin Durant, obviously one of the best players in the NBA, probably the best player 
um, on Brooklyn. And it ended, unfortunately, for them. They got annihilated by Boston in the first round of the playoffs. I mean, Boston's a great team. They're in the Western, no, not the Western Conference, the Eastern Conference Finals for a reason. They're vying for an NBA title this year if they play their cards right. But I think a lot of people were caught off guard by just how inept Brooklyn looked against Boston because you got Kevin Durant, Kyrie Irving, and they just couldn't find a way to even win one game against Boston. Now, I, I think when it comes to Kevin Durant, I think he's just taking some time away uh, just to get away from it all. And, and honestly, we've seen this from other players in the NBA. You could look at LeBron James. I mean, LeBron James, once the NBA season comes to an end, he's usually on vacation for like two to three weeks after. Like he'll go to like Europe. He'll go to like South America or Central America. He'll, he'll go somewhere for like two or three weeks to like just completely get away from basketball. And honestly, I think that's not necessarily a bad thing. When you've been dedicated to your craft for eight to nine months consistently, and when it finally comes to an end, no matter what the result is, you deserve some time off. You, you deserve some time to be able to decompress, reflect on the season. And then usually after that vacation time is over with, the family time uh, comes to an end, you got to go back in the lab and get back to it. And I think, you know, Kevin is just in that process of, I'm going to take some time to just kind of focus on me, kind of decompress for the season. And then, you know, probably within the next week or two, start, you know, ramping up for the upcoming season with Brooklyn. So I'm with the mindset that's not that big of a deal. I understand that some people could kind of make an argument is he looking for another fresh start just because, oh my God, Kevin Durant and Brooklyn's front office, they're not talking to each other. Oh my God, this is like DEFCON 1. Like we got to treat this as like, this is like a crisis. Let's pump the brakes on this one. I don't think it's that serious. Now, if it gets into the point where you're in August or in September and you're not speaking, then maybe there's a little bit more than just smoke in the air at that point. Maybe there's actually some fire to that that possibility. But as of right now, it's the end of May. The, their season ended about a month ago. I think they're probably fine. It's just that Kevin's kind of taking some time away just to get away from basketball for a little bit to just you know, decompress. But I imagine within like the next couple of weeks or so, uh, there will be some active communication between Brooklyn and, and Kevin. I don't see that as an issue. I'm going the complete opposite direction. I'm not saying DEFCOM 1. I'm not saying it is of the immediate urgency for Brooklyn to be panic mode. To me, nowadays with how sensitive society is and how soft all of these major sport leagues are, communication is key. Back in the day, if you went on a vacation to Bora Bora and you had no cell reception because there was no social media, you was on vacation. If you did that Cancun trip like you know LeBron James, CP3, and Melo and D-Way tend to do, um, like the banana boat, and this was back in the day, GMs would be like, all right, I'll talk to you when you get back. Now, if you're not hand-holding your GM or your team in terms of just a text like, hey, good morning, babe, I'm assuming that is going to be grounds for, you know, some kind of panic. But again, I'm not saying it's at the top. Because we are in 2022, and I'd say that Kevin Durant has not spoken to them in three to four weeks, I would say it's a bit of a head tilt. Right now, I'm at like DEFCOM 3, out of three, you know, like obviously one being the worst. I'm at the very bare minimum to the point where I'm tilting my head saying, mm, this is weird. You have to look at it from this perspective, right? Your second best player is potentially not coming back. Because obviously with the whole situation we just talked about with Kyrie, either he's going to be temporarily back or he's not coming back. It's not going to be a long-term deal. I don't think so. I think Brooklyn is pissed off with everything of how they've handled it. Just like I said a few minutes ago. Now you go and you say, well, I wasn't able to do it with him. I just signed my max extension last season. So after this year, I have two more years here. Do I really want to stay here for the long haul by myself? I... I I tried doing that. Uh, actually, he's never done a, a solo thing because he's always had somebody on his team with Russell and Harden and obviously Kyrie and Steph and them boys. So I don't know if he's willing to do that solo act. I think he would have went to the Knicks if that's what he wanted a few years back when they made the decision to go to Brooklyn. I think that him not talking to Brooklyn, Kyrie being in the sensitive situation that he's in, Ben Simmons just had surgery, so their money is all tied up within three players, basically, and they still need help. If Kyrie does not come back or is traded or is signs an extension in a side and trade, I think Kevin Durant is going to want out. And I may be over-exaggerating. I may be looking too into this. I may be 
talking about something that is nothing. Like Kyle said, it could just be straight up, I'm on vacation, I don't want to talk to you guys. Brooklyn got swept. Brooklyn had all the hype in the world once Kyrie was cleared. They had James Harden. It didn't pan out. They got Ben Simmons. He didn't play. KD was getting a lot of slander in that first round because Kyrie ain't show up and KD ain't play well. I would say that he's probably ticked off with the front office. Obviously, Steve Nash is not the ideal head coach for Brooklyn system. People make fun of him and say on the on the clipboard, it's it's a stick figure with past KD the ball. It's kind of comical every time I see that 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 meme on Twitter. But again, I'm not saying it's DEFCON one. I'm not saying it's a red alert. But I will say that let's not ignore this and sweep this under the rug. Kevin Durant's camp hasn't reached out for a reason. Now, whether or not that's because they're just frustrated and need space, or they're contemplating maybe get asking or seeking a trade, I don't know. But we will see as the offseason continues. I'm not going to go as far and say I'm not going to panic until September or August because the NBA free agency period does start at the beginning of July. If he has no input to this, if he has not spoken to them up until that point, I'm definitely leaning towards saying Kevin Durant wants out because obviously that means that the Kyrie signing hasn't been negotiated and taken care of. And that means that he's not interested in what Brooklyn is willing to do in the offseason to help them win. If the best player isn't included in any of those conversations, I would say that he's probably interested in getting out of Brooklyn. Kevin, are we babying these players? 100%. That's why I said, I said this generation. Do you think that's right? No, it's not right. Dude, Dirk used to go to Dirk goes to Dirk used to go to Germany after every season to see his family go back, hang out, either play in the German team, and it was just a simple talk every couple weeks. It wasn't a big deal. Kobe used to go on vacation with Vanessa and the kids. Obviously, Shaq, when he was in Miami, he used to do his things. For God's sakes, Dennis fucking Rodman used to leave mid postseason, go to damn Vegas. Not that it was approved, but it was like, bro, let Dennis do his thing. I know if you guys don't know what I'm talking about, it was in The Last Dance, the documentary on Netflix. Go check it out if you haven't seen it. Um, we are definitely coddling these players. And because he's the best person on the team, I think Brooklyn's like, hey, babe, you mad at me? Like, <laughs> That's what I'm thinking the GM is like. There's too much shit going on in Brooklyn for him not to be in communication. Uh, here's the thing. I hate this discussion yep. because – the entire focus around or essentially the entire foundation of this conversation, it is so utterly immature, childish, childish. and it just outright petty. I, yep. I, I, I think first of all, I mean, usually like after the season's over, like everybody just kind of goes home. I mean, for God's sakes, Jokic, like I think he accepted his MVP trophy in front of his horse stables in, in, in Serbia. Serbia. <laughs> like, I honestly, I thought that was a G move. Like, he's just, he's in his element. Like, he's just home. Like, that's just his thing. You know, if Kevin wants to go on vacation, you know, for two, three weeks or a month or whatever, I, I think he's earned that. Obviously, the season didn't work out the way that they wanted it to because they, you know, I think it's pretty safe to say that the, they were trying to, you know, go for an NBA title this year. That's what I think everybody's trying to go to in that situation. Of course. And if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. You know, and, you know, you've been working eight to nine months anyway. You've been putting in countless hours, you know, not just on the court, but off the court, you know, to get your body right, to get your mind right. And you have to be able to decompress. You have to be able to, you know, just relax. Because, you know, the one thing, and I can kind of speak to this, is I remember when I was younger, there were a lot of kids that would typically just play sports the entire year. So like, for example, like let's say baseball started in late March, early April, they'd play baseball until June, you know, mid June, maybe late June. If you got like all the way through the playoffs and won a championship or something like that. And then after that, you would, you know, you might play like a travel team baseball thing for, you know, most of July. And then after that, you would like transition right into football. And then once football is over from, you know, you go from September to December, you move on to basketball right after. And then you essentially just run back that entire cycle the the next year where there's no break. And and typically what would end up happening is just that you risk some sort of injury because you're not allowing your body to recover. You need some sort of recovery time. And like for me specifically, it used to be like the winter because I'd play like intramural basketball because I would play baseball in spring, I would work out 
you know, pretty consistently during the summertime uh, before football would start. So, you know, pretty much from like April until November, I was constantly doing stuff. Like my body was getting, you know, put through the ringer just based on the fact that I was playing like two sports, sometimes three sports. And, you know, you have to allow your body to be able to recover a little bit. You know, f- you know, for Kevin, you know, take take a month off, take a month and a half off, let that body recover. You know, especially when you've been putting in time for the last eight to nine months consistently. So I don't think that this is a, a, an issue for, for Brooklyn. But it's like I said, if, if it comes to like <clears throat> August and September and he's still not speaking to them, then that's something entirely different. But outside of that, I think things are fine. Obviously, things didn't work out the, the way that they wanted to this year, and everybody's disappointed and bummed about that. But no, let him let him live his life, bro. He's fine. But but we'll see, we'll see. You know, time and, will and tell. Exactly. You know, out of a hundred percent, I think there's. I'll I'll humor you with this one. There's a one percent chance that there's an actual issue here. I will leave it at that. There's a 1% chance that I think that because they're not speaking, there's, there's an actual problem. But the other 99% of me is thinking, eh, they're fine. He's just doing his own thing. Eh, he'll be back in a month. Like, just let him do his thing. But I I, I, I will say for the 1%, okay, maybe there might be a problem. <laughs> maybe. But like you said, <laughs> time will tell. But um, uh, with that said, We're going to kick it over to the NFL for our last two segments. Uh, The first one being Colin Kaepernick. And, um, well, he is actually working out for an NFL football team. Uh, It's been quite some time since we've seen Colin Kaepernick actually, you know, make some sort of uh, move to actually, you know, try to get on an NFL team. Uh, He tried to get uh, possibly on an NFL team last year, but there uh, there was a situation where, the, I think the NFL had set up a workout for him that he didn't attend. Uh, kind of left some teams out to dry in that regard. Uh, but the Las Vegas Raiders uh, put Colin Kaepernick through a workout on Wednesday. And really the, the question is now, is Las Vegas actually going to sign him? And that's the question that I'm going to pose to Kev. So Kevin, to kick this one to you, with Kaepernick working out for the Las Vegas Raiders on Wednesday, What's the likelihood of him actually signing with the Raiders? Well, I'm 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 looking at it and I'm saying first and foremost, who is on this roster? It's Derek Carr, Jared Stidham, Nick Mullins. Nick Mullins has played some meaningful football for the 49ers at some point. Um Jared Stidham was the backup for New England, right? Wasn't yes, that sir. your backup? Yes, sir. Obviously, he got no meaningful burn. So, it's Derek Carr and Mullins. Um, Mullins was in that era right after Kaepernick kind of left. It was him, C.J. Beathard, and a couple of other quarterbacks that, you know, kind of were in that rotation with Blaine Gabbard. And it's kind of funny how things come full circle is what I'm getting at. Um, Yes. We all don't know the physical capabilities of what Colin Kaepernick is right now. We haven't seen him play meaningful football in years. However... I will go based solely off of the athlete that he was when he was in the league. You cannot tell me that Colin Kaepernick is not good enough to be on an NFL roster, whether that is practice squad, scouting uh, on the scout team, third third team, and second team. Second team being the stretch. Second team being, you know, like that peak performance is actually solid. There are plenty of quarterbacks in this league where you look at it and say, how in the hell are you on a roster? Kyle made the point before we started recording. Brian Hoyer, if a veteran that cannot move, that cannot throw past 30 yards is on an active roster to hold a clipboard, Colin can do that. You're telling me that Colin Kaepernick cannot be better than, oh my God, where do I start? Sam Darnold, Drew Locke, Geno Smith. Uh, I mean, realistically, we're talking Joe Flacco is still in this league, for God's sakes. And that man is damn near 40. Ben Roethlisberger was playing with one leg. And I know that Ben still at his age is better. But I'm just saying, if we're talking about longevity, we had plenty of quarterbacks that were well past their prime that were still active. Colin Kaepernick deserves 
his opportunity just based off of his sheer talent alone. I'm not talking about anything political. By no means does this have anything to do with his stance or my beliefs or lack thereof of what he was trying to do for social injustice. Colin Kaepernick did enough in the NFL to show that he is a fully capable backup quarterback on any NFL team. Again, I'm not saying he's going to beat out Carr for the starting job. I'm not saying he's going to go out there and lead the Raiders to a Super Bowl if Derek Carr were to, God forbid, like knock on wood, tear his ACL in week one. This is more of a, I think that he was so blackballed behind the politics that people forgot the athlete that he was. And people forgot how good he was on the football field. Did he have an up and down year towards the end of it? Absolutely. Injuries, inconsistencies, coaching changes. I mean, there was there was so much stuff going on out there in San Francisco that made you believe, you know what, he was at a Super Bowl caliber quarterback level. He was mobile. He had a good arm. Um, they had a good team built around him. And he went to the Super Bowl. You know what I'm saying? Like, he had the potential, had a couple of bad years, was immediately, you know, disc- discarded from the organization. So Colin, the athlete, Colin, the football player, I believe rightfully deserves an opportunity. And if the Raiders decide to give him a chance, I think that he takes Stidham's spot. I think he has to earn the number two spot for, for Nick Mullins. I think that for sure, with his experience, just his experience alone, that would be good for Derek Carr because Derek Carr hasn't made it out of the first round. I think that would be good for Nick Mullins because that keeps him competing, saying, oh shit, I don't want to lose my second fiddle if Derek were to go down. Colin Kaepernick deserves a spot. I think that if he is in peak physical condition, if he is to actually check all the boxes that you know this, the Raiders are looking for in terms of physical football capabilities, kick the tires on it, bro. You know for a fact he's going to make less than the vet minimum because of everything that's happened out there. You're not going to give him a fully guaranteed contract. You're going to give him a bunch of incentive-based contracts and maybe a signing bonus. It's a literal low-risk, low-reward kind of situation. I don't see a real bad part about them signing him. Kevin, if we're just specifically talking about his skills as a football player, I, I think 100%. like when it comes to like what he could do, I think that he could be a viable backup. But that's pretty much the extent of it. I mean, it's been five years since he played in the NFL. The last Six. time he played, I, it was 2017, I think, was actually the last 2016. One. Okay. So even with that five, six years ago, it really doesn't matter. I mean, that's a long time. And I understand, like, him as an athlete. Like, he, I, I imagine he's still in relatively somewhat decent condition if he's actually getting a workout with the Raiders. Now, when it comes to him getting signed by the Raiders, I think it's 50-50. I'm not really sold on the idea that they're actually going to sign him. And let me break it down to you like this. Let me give you, like, two reasons why. I think they should, and two reasons why they shouldn't. And I'm going to do my best to not, like, really get into the whole political side. But there will be kind of, like, one point in particular where I think you might understand where I'm coming from with this. So let's start with, like, the two reasons when it comes to him actually making the roster and why. I think, you know, him as a backup, I, I think it could actually serve a decent purpose for the Raiders just because, you know, if, God forbid, Derek Carr were to go down, I think Kaepernick might be a better option than what the Raiders have at that quarterback room. Because let's face it, Jarrett Stidham, honestly, he's really gotten no burn in the NFL. I mean, he was behind Tom Brady for a little bit before Brady left to Tampa. And then people were thinking that Stidham could have been the number one guy when Cam Newton came into the fold, but Newton got the starting job. And then uh, Mac Jones ended up getting the starting spot for the Patriots after he got drafted out of Alabama. So when you look at the quarterback room for the Raiders, I do think that he could improve the backup spot for the Raiders just based off of the current list of quarterbacks that they have. So that's one element. And then the second element is, is I like the fact that he could still use his legs to be able to extend plays. And that was really one of his biggest uh, attributes when he was playing with the 49ers. I mean, he got them all the way to a Super Bowl against the Baltimore Ravens, and I believe it was Super Bowl 47. And, it, you know, it's not to say that, like, Colin Kaepernick was trash. I mean, when he first started his career, he was a solid quarterback, and it was really his legs that really kind of 
was the game changer. You know, really that the read option was so effective. I, I'll never forget the one play that he ran that read option against the Packers in the NFC Championship game where he bolted for like a 65 to 70 yard touchdown run where he just outran everybody. You know, he had a good start to his career, but as time went along, the NFL and teams made adjustments against him to the point where he was kind of predictable. And you saw a precipitous drop off in his production. Now, you could blame that on coaching staff issues. You could blame that on just player rotation. Guys were getting older, they were bringing new players into the fold, and the team wasn't as viable anymore. That's all true. But as a quarterback, you know, when you look at some of his stats, you know, towards the like the end of his career with the 49ers, well, let's face it, you know, the guy was throwing, I mean, like nine to 10 touchdowns a game. I mean, not, 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 not nine to 10 touchdowns a game, a nine to 10 touchdowns a season. So, you know, there's definitely some room to be desired there. Now, let me focus on the negative aspects of why bringing him in may not be the best thing. It's so like I said, he hasn't been on an NFL team in five to six years. We don't know how viable he's going to be, even in a backup role. Because, you know, if you look at, at the workout, just because he worked out doesn't mean that he actually did well in the workout. I mean, you know, if you if you want to just be you know positive about it, you would hope that he would you know, do fine in the workout and he would show that the Raiders, that he still has something left in the tank. But we don't really know that yet. And when you've been out of the game that long and, you know, with him, he has kind of a, a pretty uh, obvious record of what he's done the last five, six years with really being a, a social activist. Um, we just don't know how well he's going to, you know, transition back into the NFL if that's actually the case if he does get signed. And there's no guarantee that he will get signed just based off of just one workout with the Raiders. And then this is the second part. And this is where I'm going to kind of have to be careful because Kevin and I really try to make it a point to not really inject politics into this. Obviously, Colin Kaepernick has has a very clear stance on how he feels about really just kind of like the social issues that the country has at the current moment in time. Is he going to bring that into the locker room? And I, and I think that's something that you kind of have to consider. Not to the point where it's like, yeah, we, it's like we're not bringing you in because of that alone. But it, I think if the Raiders were to think about signing him, it would come with the idea of, look, we understand where your stances are on all of these political issues at this current moment in time. But it's like when you come here to work, you have to put that to the side when you're at work. If you want to do that in your in your free time, when, you know, the season's over and you can do whatever you want, that's fine. But it's like when you're here to play, you know, football, you know, you have to be all of that. You know, and I think it kind of comes with the territory of maybe the Raiders just don't want to deal with that type of distraction if he's going to inject politics throughout the season. And, and that's really kind of the thing is, you know, when it comes to the Raiders specifically, they, I think they want to keep a lot of the players focused on, you know, going out and trying to compete for the top of the AFC West, which is going to be a very difficult endeavor because of how stacked that division is. And then when you start injecting some sort of po political commentary based on, you know, Kaepernick's stances, if he actually starts, you know, kind of going down that path, that's another thing. You know, then it kind of becomes a whole different uh, scenario at that point where the team is kind of more in the headlines based on what Kaepernick is saying for political stances than what the team is actually trying to achieve as far as, you know, trying to compete for a Super Bowl. And, and that's kind of one of these things. It's like, I understand, you know, players, they have their feelings and they have their opinions on, on certain social matters and certain social issues. And I don't begrudge them for, for having those opinions. But it's like, you have to understand, like, you have to focus on your job. And, you know, the job is trying to compete at the highest level possible to try to win a Super Bowl. And that that's a priority because that, you know, that's what makes these guys money. That's what, you know, brings, you know, food on the table for them. You know, their political stances and how they, you know, see what's going on around the world. I understand it, it can be very important to them. And I, and I don't begrudge that point, but it's, it's kind of secondary based on, you know, that type of, that type of landscape doesn't really bring them money unless you're Colin Kaepernick where, you know, he made like millions of dollars outside of football because he fully dove into uh, the whole 
social justice realm. But, you know, the way that I look at it is, you know, Kaepernick as an athlete, I can't deny the fact that he's a solid athlete. You know, the guy is incredibly talented. I, Kevin, we can't deny that. It's just, you know, when it comes to the Raiders possibly signing him, you know, it's just the certain things that you have to kind of factor in. You got, you kind of have to weigh the pros and the cons when it comes to him. Obviously, the pros is he's a, he's a great athlete. He's shown that in his NFL career. And the cons are, is he going to be a distraction with all the political commentary that he may bring into the fold? You know, that's something that they're going to have to kind of figure out if they want to sign him on to the roster going into the season. But, you know, if I had to say, um, just based off of his skill set alone, and you put the politics to the side, I think that he could earn a backup spot in the NFL. Could it be with the Raiders? Potentially. You know, we'll kind of see how it plays out, but I think just based off of his skill set alone, I, I think he could earn a backup spot. But it's like I said, he has to earn it. You know, he doesn't deserve one. He has to earn it. And that just kind of goes without saying. But, you know, we'll see We'll see what happens. But, you know, obviously it's an interesting story. Um, we'll keep an eye on it. But I, I think when it's all said and done, you know, I wouldn't be mad if he, he got a starting, not a starting spot, a, a backup spot. I think a starting spot is, is, is way too far. I think if anybody's really starting to say like he deserves a starting spot in the NFL, I think they, they've gone too far because I don't think his skill sets there anymore, but a backup, I think, I think he could get that. Yeah. I mean, obviously I'm in full agreement with, with everything you said. And, you know, in my point, yeah. I said he needs to earn that, that, that backup yeah. spot by no means is that just given, Oh, you're Colin Kaepernick. You're Colin Kaepernick from six years ago. No, 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 no. I don't give a shit if your workout went flawless. You're earning a spot because you worked out and you earned it via a tryout. We have other veteran quarterbacks in here that are going to compete for the second and third string jobs. Hell, even the fourth string job. You got to show in and make sure that you beat these guys out. Not because of your name, because of your ability. Well, and, and I wanted to make sure, like, I didn't want to, like, dive, like, too much into to the political stuff. But it's like... The, the the political aspect of it is something that you kind of have to factor in when it comes to like locker room chemistry because it's unfortunate, a, but yeah, a, a very, like a, a good example. Of that was what I kind of brought up earlier with the Kyrie Irving situation when they were in the bubble, he was essentially saying that the NBA should boycott the playoffs or like the team, like the individual players, the individual teams that were left in the playoffs should, you know, boycott, you know, the entire playoffs. And not everybody was on board with that. You know, because there are players that were on the active roster that weren't getting like major start like minutes. I'm like, look, bro, those are game checks. Like, if you're gonna tell me like, wait, you know, I understand, you know, everybody has like their feeling on whatever sort of social issues going on, but it's like, dude, I gotta get, I gotta get my money. Yeah. You know, I, I signed on, to, you know, you know, to get paid. Like, I, I, you know, I gotta make my money. You know, and I understand, like, you know. Things get tense, you know, especially, you know, with, with just the climate of just the political landscape right now. I totally get that. But it's just, you kind of have to factor in. It's like, is he going to be a distraction with if he's bringing up some sort of political commentary into the locker room? And I understand that everybody has their opinion on that. It's just that, is that going to be to the benefit of the team? Is that going to be to ben the benefit of locker room chemistry? If he's able, if he puts that to the side during the season, and if he wants to do whatever he wants in the off season, that's fine. You know, as long as it's not hindering the team itself, where, you know, the team just becomes ensconced in some sort of you know political story that he brings up constantly in you know in and out. But, you know, I mean, we'll see. It, it, it's been five six years. I understand that he has his positions, but you know, when it comes to him as an athlete specifically, you know. We'll kind of see. It's been five, six years. So we don't really know, you know, what he has left in the tank. But Not at you, all. You, you could say, you know, if he's he's been healthy the last five, six years, he's definitely had some time to recover in that regard. So, you know, when it comes to a backup role, you know, I, I think he can I think he can definitely earn that. Yeah. You know, I'm gonna make I'm gonna, I'm gonna make one final point. And I'm not getting into the politics portion of it. I'm getting into the facts. Tony O'Brown. Uh, um, of course, now I'm going to forget this man's name. Oh, my God. Hardy. 
What the? Oh, Greg, Greg, Greg Hardy, Greg Hardy, Greg Hardy, Josh Gordon, Johnny Manziel. All these players that have been reinstated a multitude of times, that have been forgiven for their heinous crimes, distracting crimes, were allowed to play football. Let's Mm -hmm. let's just remember, Mm -hmm. he didn't do anything against the law. He didn't do anything that involved harming an individual. He spoke what he felt was right. Now, regardless if it's right or wrong, if you're going to allow Greg Hardy, who beat the living shit out of a human being, a woman at that, and pay him millions of dollars, regardless of his athleticism, which, would, which is what it ended up being paid because, well, he's a great athlete. He's a great asset to the team. We're going we're, we're gonna to monitor him severely. You gave him a job, though, right? He had beat multi, mul, 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 multiple women. How many times Josh Gordon been suspended for weed? As irrelevant as that is, he had broke league policy over and over and over. Johnny Manziel was a walking drunk and was given chance after chance. The list goes on in NFL players and athletes in general that have broken laws and have done horrible things that have been given chances from way worse things. Let's just not lose in translation. This man just spoke his mind about what he felt was right. That's it. Well, I think like when it comes to, I fully understand the sentiment of where you're coming from. I think, I think the part where we look at like Kaepernick, obviously Kaepernick has his opinions and, and he's, enti- he's entitled to those opinions. I think the part where, you know, there was a lot of bit of, there was a lot of, you know, conflict was the fact that it was, it was divisive. Right. And, and, I, and I, and I understand like, you know, he had a stance on it and a lot of people have their own stances on it, but it's a very divisive issue. And, and beating a woman's not? It, all of them got wives. All of them got daughters, I, moms. Well, bro, if I'm, if I'm in a locker room and you in a locker room, and I know we think very similarly in a lot of ways, it, oh yeah, bro, we, we and you problems. suiting up next to me, yeah. knowing you, bro, I'm not, I'm not fucking with you. You're not, we're not cool. We're not boys. I'm, well, not, I'm not breaking down the huddle with you. I'm not going for a beer with you. Dude, you are a scumbag. You are here because you are six foot, whatever the fuck, and you can do your job the best that I've ever seen. Mm-hmm. That's it. We're, we're, we're going for a championship. You're my, you're my coworker. That's it. I don't like, know proof that my boss hired you. That, that in and of itself to me immediately nullifies whatever the fuck Colin did. Despite people's opinions of his political stances, we are literally hiring women beaters. That's it, bro. There's no worse than that. You know, I will say this, you know, there's just, when it, when it comes to the players that are signed on by NFL teams, they're specifically looking at what sort of service that they can provide to the team. And, and they, and the thing is they overlook the whole character flaw issue. And, you know, if you were to look at like the rest of society, you, you when you're going for a job, typically when it comes to character flaws, you, that's usually a deterrent from actually like getting a job 100%. of yeah. like actual, like, you know, meaning like of actual stature. But, you know, when it comes to Kaepernick, I think the thing with him is that like people, people could you know side with him one way or another. You, you know, right? Doesn't matter, left, it, right, it, po- it, the, the it, Democratic, it, Republic. It, it's irrelevant. It, it doesn't matter. Like, but it's the it's the division that it caused, and and, and the thing is, I, I know that you know if he were to come back into the fold in the NFL, you, you know that whole that whole story is going to get dug up and you know, it's, it's going to become a focal point when he does come back in. And that's just kind of a reality of the situation. Now, to me, it's been five, six years. Has he changed his stance on it things or has he pretty much stayed pat? Uh, just let I, it go, I, I, bro. I, I, I'd probably assume that, you know, those things are the same, but you know, if he can go out there and provide a service for a team, you know, we'll see. But I mean, you know, when it comes to, you know, the comparison of like, you know, c- like committing an actual crime compared to what Kaepernick did. You know, some people can make the argument of what Kaepernick did was worse because he divided the whole country. You you can make that point. But, you know, it's it just comes down to what you think of him. Yep. And, that, yep. and honestly, you know, that that's person by person. So yep. but I will say this just to kind of round out the, the segment. I, I think as long as he, you know does what he needs to do in, in the workout. He has, he has to earn that spot. He can't just, I, I'm not of the point like where somebody deserves something. You have to earn right. it. 
And if, if Kaepernick does what he's supposed to do, if he puts himself in a good position, hopefully he'll earn that. But, you know, I, I want to make the distinction. Like, Kaepernick doesn't deserve a spot simply just because he got blackballed from the NFL. And, you know, he gets a job just simply out of sympathy. Like, I'm, I'm not going to nope. go that route. He has to earn his spot. You know, it's based on his actual attributes that he presents on the field and off the field, too. So, you know, we'll see what happens. Obviously, we'll, we'll keep our eyes focused on that. But I thought that was a, I thought it was good. That was that was a good discussion. Yeah, no, it definitely was. And, it, you know, it didn't get aggressive. It didn't get political. We made points. And, you know, guys, again, this is our opinions. We are not telling you that this is what it needs to be. If you feel that this was offensive, we apologize. None of this was it, meant to do that. It, this you is know. relatively tame. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. You know, but again, we talked about this in another segment. Society is just different nowadays, and people it, tend to get offended for a lot of different things. Yeah, it, it's like, and look, like, you know, people get they get so like entrenched in like one side or the other. Like, if you're not with us, like you're against us. Like, I'm like, exactly. Dude, that's what I'm saying. Like, be objective, bro. Just objective. We're talking about an athlete and his physical yeah. capabilities to be productive on the football field. That is it. Yeah, and that, and that's really like the point that we focus on. That's what we at least try to do. So, listen, feel one way about it, let us know. But w with that said, we're going to move on to the last segment, which is not going to be in any way, shape, or form uh, controversial. This is going to be pretty straightforward. Uh, the Pro Bowl. The, the Pro Bowl is in the headlines because there is a real possibility that the Pro Bowl could be on its way out due to its really just its dwindling uh, entertainment Thank value over the, the last couple of years. I mean, some of these Pro Bowls have just become to the point where they are unwatchable. But, um, you know, as it stands right now, uh, the owners are possibly discussing a situation where the Pro Bowl will no longer happen simply just because it's just not providing the entertainment value that it used to. And that's where I'm going to pose the question to Kev. Kev, do you think that the NFL should just get rid of the Pro Bowl entirely? Yes. How many times can I say yes? How many how, how many times you want me to say into the microphone? You want me to do like what what do I need to say to get this point across? If there's no contact, if there is no drive and motivation to want to be competitive, this game should not exist. We have talked about this a number of times for years prior to this podcast even existing. Kyle and I have been saying, why are we doing this? What is the point? If you're going to do an all-star game, it's not like the NBA where you have to kind of score for a charitable organization. It, what, why? For what? This isn't fun. It's not entertaining. Nobody turns it up in the fourth quarter. For God's sakes, it, it, it literally is boring from start to finish because it's, it's, it's equivalently, it has equivalently become two-hand touch. If that's the case, take the pads off. At least we know we're not watching content football because what we're watching is not football. It used to be fun. You used to be able to tackle. You used to be able to like just just go all out to face a rival, a guy that you felt was not better than you, a guy that maybe got voted in as a starter and you didn't, and you're trying to like make a name for yourself, whatever. Dude, the Pro Bowl is in shambles. Nobody watches it. Nobody wants to go to it. I mean, it used to be in Hawaii. Then it started falling apart. Then it went to Orlando. Now it's going to be in Vegas. It's like... No one can afford to go to Vegas. No one wants to spend money to, to stay in Vegas. And I'm going to spend a couple hundred, if not a couple thousand dollars on a ticket? You're crazy. To watch garbage? No thanks. No thanks. If for all intents and purposes, this is long overdue. And this needs to be converted into what's like similar to a skills challenge, like what it used to be back in the early 2000s. Quarterback competitions, running back competitions, wide receiver catch and drills, just just fun things. The things that they do like before the Pro Bowl, make it really, really competitive. Put an incentive at the end of it. Make it a competition for charitable organizations. I don't know. Get get people drawing at each other. People used to be excited to go to the Pro Bowl. It also used to be after the Super Bowl so that everybody could partake. And then you relocated it a different you you changed the date and you relocated it to a different place. I don't, I, I don't necessarily agree with all the things that have happened over the last decade or so since everything started getting worse, but the Pro Bowl needs to stop. It's outlived its purpose, and it, it, it's just not fun anymore. Kev, I, I hate to be in agreement with you on this one, but um, I think it's time. I think it's time to just finally do away with it. And you know what's kind of crazy 
is this is a situation where I don't think like, like, like the owners or like the, like the NFL is like an organization screwed this one up. I have to be honest with you on this one. I think the players screwed this one up because they just, they just don't find it competitive. Like they just don't really put any sort of competitive effort into it. And I'm not saying like you have to go into the pro bowl. Like you're going to go balls to the wall. Crazy. Going like it was the Super Bowl, like yeah, yeah no. you, like you don't have to do that, but it's like, for God's sakes, like at least make it a little bit competitive, just like for the sheer nature of just the best players competing at somewhat of a competitive level. But when you look at some of these games that have taken place with the Pro Bowl the last couple of years, I mean, it's been a borderline joke, if not just an outright joke. I mean, essentially, it's basically gotten to the point where it's two hand touch with pads. Like, are you kidding me? Like, the, like, oh my God, like, we can't touch the players. Like, we can't tackle the players because, you know, for God's sakes, if someone gets hurt, you know, it could potentially ruin their season. I, I understand that aspect, but I, Kevin, I used to play football. And I, I used to play, you know, pretty fast all the time. But there used to be a speed, like, where, like, you knew where you would take it off a little bit. You weren't, like, competing at, like, the highest level possible. You know, and usually that was like a practice, that was a practice speed. If they were to just to do that in the Pro Bowl, where they're they're not going like a hundred percent, but if they're going like 75, 80%, that's good enough for me. They want to turn it up at the end just to kind of make it a little bit competitive in the fourth quarter. That'd be fine. But with the way that it's gone, where it's essentially just two hand touch now, the players ruined it. And I hate to say that. They they did. And I understand where they're coming from because they they view it as, you know, we're potentially risking our health in that way. I mean, I think that's a really bad excuse, though. I, I'm just going to be flat out honest. I, I think that there are better reasons uh, to come up with why you don't want to be in the Super uh, Bowl. Not, not in the Super Bowl. In the Pro Bowl. Just say that you don't want to be there. Just be honest about it then. Just, think, just say that it's a waste of time and that's it. At least then I would know, like, they're just being honest. But, you know, at this point, it's just the way that it's been going. It, it doesn't have the same, entertain, the same entertainment value as it used to. I, I actually liked when it used to be after the Super Bowl. I think that was actually the appropriate time to actually have it because then everybody could actually uh, come into the fold and, and just kind of enjoy like the, a week where, you know, you can kind of like reflect on the season. You can reflect on the Super Bowl champions and... You know, then you just kind of have like a nice little game between the AFC and the NFC to just kind of wrap up the season. I actually liked that. I thought that that was pretty cool. But now that they have it, you know, before the Super Bowl, I think it's, I don't think it's necessarily the best thing anymore, but nope. it's, it, it's really just a disappointment. So I, I honestly, I think the, uh, the whole idea of a Pro Bowl is pretty cool. But with the way that the players ha have turned it into, it's just a joke. And, and it's on the players. The players have really turned it into this and it's, unfortunate that's really just how i see it yeah once again for the final reiteration of what i'm saying this generation of athletes is different you're soft take it however you want soft i, I just I not willing to They're put soft. effort into it they dude i am in full agreement for a lot of these young players bro go get your bag you don't want to play don't play then don't go if that is what you're worried about give me and I'm only saying this for the sake of just for the take. If you don't want to play, there are probably a couple hundred players that would kill to be announced to go to the Pro Bowl. If you have zero interest in playing, just here, give it to somebody else. Give it to somebody that wants to try. If you're that worried about your career, you're in a contract year, you've been injured, or you just played in 17 weeks plus the OTAs, plus pro welcome to the fucking club. You signed up for this. There is an all-star game. In most game, in most leagues, unfortunately, you can't do it in the middle of the season for the NFL because there's only 16 games. Baseball does 17. it midseason. Basketball, you know what I mean. Well, basketball does it midseason. We're 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 really gonna sit here and talk about the All Star game at the end of the year, and you're so focused about your check, you're not even gonna partake in what the, us fans selected you to be in. Now, I'm not going out as far on a limb to say that just because I say to do it, you got to do it because we're paying to watch you. Just like you don't want to play, I don't have to pay to go see you, so it doesn't really make a difference. It kind of goes back and forth. 
But what I'm saying is, you were chosen as a top candidate to be one of the best players in the league by the fans. There are people that want to go. There are financial stakes at the end of this. The NFL has a lot riding on this with viewership and money and and investments and all these different things. But the bottom line, if you're voted and you're not going to even touch the field or you have no effort in trying, bro, give your spot up. You can still go and stand on the sideline and say, you know, I was the first ballot or first voted person or whatever, or I had the most votes, but I decided to delegate it to somebody who really wanted to be here. I think that would make this better because at that point, that's a, that's a showcase for people that don't get attention. That's a showcase for people that actually don't get the shine that the number ones and the number twos do in the league. Shit, make a Pro Bowl for like third, fourth string. At least I know for a fact they'll try. That could be a moment. That could be a tryout. That could be something for them to get noticed by another team. I'm just thinking of possibilities. If you don't want to get rid of the Pro Bowl, you got to do something to change it up. You can't just have people walking in there saying, all right, I'm going to practice for four days and then I'm going to get the ball at whatever position I am and the second I'm touched I'm stopping that's not a football bro for that I'd rather watch senior citizens play fucking shuffleboard at the nursing home down the block (laughs) it's the same fucking thing it's just Kevin I really do just hate to say it but I I hate it too bro I do they're soft they're soft I understand listen I understand this whole thing about player empowerment and, and making sure that your brand is prote- protected. And it's usually just because you stay healthy. Right. I fully understand that. But when it comes to a Pro Bowl game and you came and handle 80 to 85% speed and you got to revert the game to two hand touch with pads on, you are soft. I don't care how it comes off. I don't care the fact that these guys make millions of dollars doing this. You can't handle a game at 80, 85% speed, no matter what the reason is. If you're talking about an injury, an injury can happen literally wherever. I mean, for God's sakes, Tariq Cohen freaking blew an Achilles in a workout. After, I think he just tore his ACL or broke his leg or something like that. Yeah, it was Um, an ACL the year before that, so he was still recovering to get signed. I'm like, you could get injured any time. I'm like, in a Pro Bowl game, do do injuries happen? Probably. Yes. Oh my God. You might twist an ankle. Oh my God. You might, someone might actually hit you. You might actually get a, like a, a bruise or something like that. You'll be fine. You have the entire off season to recover from that. But I, I, I understand like, you know, the, the, the player safety aspect. Cause you know, it could somewhat, you know, hinder their future. If they actually like, yeah. suffer some yeah, sort of we, significant we've injury. Seen, we've seen but, people but, get hurt on non-contact. Like, look at Odell. That was in the Super Bowl. I know. So uh, we, we get it, guys. We're not it, saying, we're not being heartless, but this is the point I, of the segment. You know, I, I, the, the Pro Bowl a, isn't I, what it used to be. I, I'll be a little heartless and say that they're soft. They can't handle not a game heartless, eight. though. We're, we're used to a different right. era. I mean, we have Pro Bowl highlights of Sean Kev, Taylor Kev, knocking Kev, out people Kev, in the Kev, fucking Kev, game. Kev, Kev, I mean, for God's sakes... I mean, back in the 70s and the 80s, I I don't care what these guys... I, I know, like, some of the, the 70s and the 80s players are still around. They would look at this group of players, and I'm like, they would be laughing at these guys. They do. They are Shannon sick. Sharp he knows is they're laughing. So- they, they know they're soft. They just won't... Granted, he's from public. the late 80s or early 90s, 90s but the point yeah. is, you know what I'm saying? He's an older... He's an OG. Yeah, but deep down, like, if you were to, like, get, like, an off-the-record conversation with Shannon Sharp, and he, you were to ask him, what do you think of the current NFL player when it comes to j- just their overall mentality? I guarantee you, he would say it off record. They're soft. He has said it on record. He's tweeted it. He's talked about it on his podcast. He said it on first take or, or whatever undisputed. the hell segment he's undisputed. Bro, he played the sport. If he were to come out of left field and say that the NFL is the softest organization out of all pro sports he played in it. He's a Hall of Famer. He's a Super Bowl champion. He's one of the greatest of his position in history. I'm going to listen to him because he's been through it, because he's been in the Pro Bowl. He's done the whole season and the grueling and the grinding back when tight ends were actually a lot more physical than they are now. I'm going to listen to someone that played in this game as opposed to Stephen A. Smith, Max Kellerman, you know, like people that never touched the field. When you hear somebody of his caliber at that era, and he's insulting it, 
shouldn't be around anymore, bro. Yeah, I, I, I will ad- always adhere to that. Have you ever looked at some of the old pictures of the steel curtain back in the 70s and you looked at some of those some of those dudes? Those dudes were boys, bro. Those dudes, those were men. They were, they were, they were mean. They didn't give a fuck. Like they were just built different. Prax. And, and, and the thing is, those guys, like the guys, like as far as just their overall mentality goes when it comes to like the, the current player today, couldn't hold a candle to those guys. No. Like those dudes, granted, I wouldn't say like, you know, th- those guys were athletic for their time. Right. You know, obviously, I think, you know, this generation's athlete is more athletic than what it was back in the 70s and 80s. Those dudes, though, those dudes were tough as nails back then, though. Those dudes, bro, they would hit like a fucking freight train. It's just, um, it's just unfortunate that that doesn't actually carry over from generation to generation. Maybe, you know, I'm hoping that, you know, maybe like the next generation that comes up after this one would be a little bit tougher, but I doubt it. I, I, I have my doubts. Me too, my friend. Me too. We, uh, I don't know how you reverse people getting soft, Kevin. I, I, I don't know how you stop it. I, I just don't. It's not no, just a sport. It's, don't. A, it's not a sports issue. It's, it's more of a societal issue. It's a fact. It's just, well, I, I think we can, uh, we can leave that to, for another day. And, uh, um, yeah, a hundred percent. I, I think, uh, I think that just about wraps it up, Kev. We got all of our topics knocked out. So we're almost coming up on two hours. So. I was literally just about to say the same thing. I said, I think we got lost in the the Mavericks conversation, the Kaepernick situation, and then we turned the Pro Bowl segment into something that was a lot longer than what we thought. But it, bro, it was it, fair it, though. It's, it's it's great content. Oh yeah, that's just well. Listen, you know when it comes to the Pro Bowl and, and you get to talk about you know, some of the players and just the overall mentality of these this new generation, they're soft. Obviously, that's kind of fun because I just let it fly. I don't care. But, yeah, you know. It's what I think. I'm hey, totally but I'm not. I'm not. Dis- I'm not disagreeing with you. It's just, it's just what it is, bro. <sighs> but um, Kev, I don't really have anything much else to say other than just um, appreciate you guys tuning in, whether it was on YouTube or on the audio platforms like Spotify, uh, like Spotify or Apple Podcasts. Spotify. Uh, definitely- Spotify. <laughs> 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 oh, we definitely appreciate you guys tuning in. Um. We'll probably drop another segment after the Mavericks probably get beat by the Warriors on Thursday night. So we'll um, to be determined in my emotional state. Yeah, the, the thing is, that if the Mavericks get blown up by thirty, Kevin's going to be dejected. If he if the Mavericks lose by five in a game that they probably should have won, he's going to be outright pissed. So and that I will gladly get on. But if it's a blowout and embarrassing kind of thing i'm gonna be like you know what i'm gonna take a day i'm gonna recover i'm gonna sleep on it and if we do an episode like during the day on friday or something like that or at the end of the evening maybe potentially but if it's a blowout you're not gonna see your boy for a couple days yeah he's gonna be he could be depressed but he shouldn't be the mavs got pretty far this year so it's something to hang a hat on but kev that's all i got to say so you could take this one out out if you want to all right well ladies and gentlemen as always we could not be here without you guys. I know that the content has been a little dry in terms of view-wise, but, I mean, Kyle and I are still having a great time. Um, we're looking to get stuff rolling. Uh, TikTok is moving forward. We're getting good traction there. Twitter is growing. We're almost at 700 followers. Uh, I mean, we're, we're, just, we're just chopping along, making sure that we're just being consistent. And, again, we're just grateful to have this opportunity to talk about the things that we would talk about off the air anyway. So um, thank you guys for the support audio youtube social media whatever it is thank you thank you so much but uh if we're not recording tomorrow after the game we will be recording our usual sunday night so outside of that kyle i'm done i'm good to go and uh, we'll see you guys soon yeah other than that um thank you guys for tuning in and uh we'll see you guys later